Hi, my name is Jan Norris, and I'm a professor at LSU. Today I'm talking to you about the power of using Inkscape for virtual learning. So what is Inkscape? It's a free graphics program. You download it from the internet. It's available in Windows, Mac, and GNU. It's typically used as a drawing or graphics program. But today we're going to talk about how it also works great as a tablet for teaching or speech language therapy. And it's an excellent tool for online teaching or use with a smart board in a classroom. So this is what an Inkscape looks like. There's a window in the center of it. And I can put lots of things on the window and the areas around it. So I'm going to put a page from a book on my window. Now I'm going to put some sight words. These are called morphophonic faces. They give a clue to the first sound, e. the little phonic face says e, and the mouse is in the N. The G says g, 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 and then she's pushing away the mouse this time, so he has to go, um, etc. So the Morphophonic faces give both sound and meaning cues, and there are also morphemes like plurals. I can use things like lines and squares to highlight a word, and that moves right on top of the picture. I'm using phonic faces on top of the picture as well. Um, the phonic faces give you a visual cue to what letter sounds make. Y, uh, Yuck. And then I can use text to look at word families or words that rhyme with yuck. Okay, so I've got multiple things that I can layer onto the same Inkscape. So these are the things that we're going to talk about in this workshop how to use the pick tool, how to use the zoom options, how to import objects, how to export objects, how to group and ungroup objects, lock them onto the board, highlight words, store objects, how to save a file, how to open files. You can download Inkscape for free off the internet. It was recommended to me by LSU in the IT department as being a safe program. And again, there is a Windows and a Mac download. Um, so use this link for the Mac. I also have dozens of stories that I've set up on Inkscape. They range from pre-K through fourth grade level. So if you're interested in any of these free materials, email me at jnorris at lsu.edu and I'd be happy to share them. For a free instructional manual, you can go to um, this elementary.com site and there's a free manual that you just download. So there's this the download of, you can either go to the elementary main page and then go to downloadable products for teletherapy or you can try that link directly. This is easier to type in since you probably won't have access to the PowerPoint. And you can find a similar video program posted on the elementary website as well. So I hope you enjoy today's program. Quickly, this is just a copy of that manual I was talking about. So there's a table of contents that talks about the things we just showed, why Inkscape, setting up your window, turning on the control, Bar is picking tool and what you use it for, rotating objects, layering objects, all of the things that we're going to talk about are carefully depicted and, and uh, explained to you in that manual. Okay. So I've outlined for us some of the things
that we're going to talk about. So the first one is setting up your window. And you can set up your window as either portrait, which is the uh, configuration it's in right now, or landscape. So I'm going to go over here to File. And I'm going to go to Document Properties. And it'll give me a window. And so I can set up the size that I want. I can set up the specific width and height if I want to. But for right now, all I want to do is change it to landscape. So now you can see that the window has changed to this sort of horizontal length and portrait is back up to that vertical. Okay, so I'm going to leave it in landscape. And then I can just close it. Okay, the control bar and icons. I've got all kinds of icons down the left hand side of the page and they are going to trigger different control bars. So I'm going to just make a square on my page. So this is just shapes. I can make a square, I can make a circle. And you can see that it is picked. So that's the picking tool. Um, and then it's going to have a control bar up here. And so the control bar is going to show the kinds of um, actions that the picking tool can do. So again, these icons are going to be very critical when you're using Inkscape because they tell the way that you manipulate the objects on the window, et cetera, are basically controlled by these and some of the information under the path. All right, so the pick tool is the one that we're using right now. I'm going to move over here to the yuck soup. And we'll look at some of the things that the picking tool can do. All right, so I can pick my picture and then I can do things like turn it or flip it. So when I turn it on this direction, it goes sideways. This way it puts it back or I can go to the right. I can reverse it so that I'm reading backwards. I can turn it upside down right side up again. So this is basically, you know, the one way that you can manipulate your objects using these controls for how you want to orient your objects. I can put another object on top. But if I decide that um, I don't really want it on top, I can click this and over here, these um, lines that show you a yellow line at the bottom, a yellow line, one up from the bottom, a white line, that one down from the top, and a white line from the top. That's basically telling you how you want to layer your objects. So I'm going to put the yuck soup at the top instead of the bottom. And I can now see the square behind it. But if I just move it up, I can no longer see the square because it's covering it. It's on a different layer. If I want the square to be in front, then I can click on it and move it to the front. And then I can move it into any position I want to with the pick tool. So the pick tool is going to allow me to do a lot of different things to the objects, they the way that I manipulate the object. Okay, um, I can also rotate the object. So when you look at this little square that I made, if I click it once, the arrows tell me I can make it larger or smaller. So I can just grab it and make it larger or smaller. If I double click it, I can also rotate it. So I can put it at any angle that I want to. So I move my object around using that pick tool. Okay, I can make it narrower so it doesn't cover the word soup, or I can make it wider so that it covers both words. 
So the pick tool is essential to just about everything that you do. One important thing is this lock at the top. I'm gonna to unlock it. And what happens when you unlock it is that things can get out of proportion quickly. So if I try to make my yuck soup bigger, but you know, I'm sort of grabbing it the wrong way, then you can see how distorted it's getting. So my um, dimensions are not proportional. I'm going to do control Z, Z as in zebra, because that puts it back where it's supposed to be. And then I'm going to lock it. And now when I grab it, it stays proportional. I can make it wider, but it's going to be proportionally wide. Okay, control Z, we'll put it back where it's supposed to be. Okay, so those are some of the basic things that I can do with a pick tool. We just changed the size and we locked it. One thing about changing the size is I can look over here and I can see that my width is 150. So now if I bring a second object down and I want it to be on top of my yuck soup, again, it's behind. So remember, I'm gonna go over here to these lines and move it to the top. And then instead of trying to you know, grab it in size it and figure that out, I'm just going to say 150. And now it's the same size as the previous object. And so I can just put it on top. So I've got the original cover and I've got the inside cover. So if I wanted to have a new page, I can just make it the same size and cover the old page. These are double pages. And again, they're in the back. So I'm just going to go over to the top and put them at the top. And I think when I did this earlier, it was 385 for a double page width. Okay, and that basically covers the page. And I can continue to do that. Bring down the new one. Remember, I've got to move it to the front. I'm going to go 385. And now it's on top. All right, so I can easily get back to my previous pages if there's something that I want to say. Oh, remember last time he put in the snails and this time he's putting in the thistles. So I can you know, move between my pages just by putting them on top of each other. I store them in a small format um, above the window. Okay, and if I want to put them back, I just do Control Z, Control Z, Control Z. And now we're back to where we started. All right, multiple objects. We're gonna pull up my phonic faces. Okay, I've got these on a separate Inkscape page. And so um, I want to look at um, one of the words. And so I'm going to bring my page up. No, it doesn't like that. It needs to be enlarged on the side a little bit. Okay. So I want to look at the word snails with the kids. Um, and so I'm going to pick out my phonic faces that I want and hold my shift key down, get the ones that I want. I'm going to control copy and control paste. All right, 
So now I've moved them from one Inkscape into another just using copy and paste. So my lock is on. So now when I pull them, they're all going to enlarge at the same size. S, N, A, I gotta get my I. So I'm gonna come back over here, find my I. All right, so we've got the faces. Well, the faces are now telling me to say s n a i o, and that's not the word that I want. So we have to apply one of the phonics rules. That's that two vowels go walking. So when you've got you know two vowels that are two babies, so the short vowels are babies, and the uh, adult vowels are the long vowels. When you've got two babies together, they could easily run off because there's no kid in the middle to catch them. So the babies could just take off running. So when two babies are together, they could go running. And so to stop that from happening, the adult of the first vowel comes in and notice she's behind the other two. So remember, I have to go up here and move her to the front. Here we go. I can make her a little bit bigger. Now the adult A sound makes her sound A, 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 A. So now it's going to be sn, A, O, sn, A, O. And the kids can visually see how those two babies got captured by one long adult vowel sound. All right. So I had to copy, do the copy and the paste command to go from one inkscape to another. I can't just drag um, objects off of one and put them onto another. All right, so that's multiple objects. S, N, A. Okay, so I'll group them over here. So let's say I've got these three I will put that little circle around it and do a control G. And the control G makes them a group. So now whatever I do to one, it's doing it to all three of them. But now I wanna rearrange their order. So I'm going to do control U or control ungroup. And now they are back to being individual um, objects again. And then I can um, move one of them if I want to and move them back again. If I decide I want to make SN a blend, I can group that together. So control G groups those two together. And then if I want to do the A and the I as an object, then I can group those together. If I want to show that the this A, the long A, makes, uh, I just did it again, makes the sound, I can group the three of them together. Scroll bars, Scroll bars just position the window so I can move the window over so that now, if I want to, I can, remember I need to make that the top, pull it down. So if I want to look at the little sight words, then I can move my scroll bar so that those are more visible and I can just pick them and move them in go some snails. Okay, I can add the letter S T 
to indicate that it's plural, or I can go over to this window and I can find the plural face. Oops, I forgot to have my lock on. There we go. And the plural is a, the S phonic face, except that it's in a different shape or color, and it has multiple S's around her mouth because it's talking about more than one. All right, so these are just visual strategies I use with LD kids to help them understand some of these difficult language concepts. If they can see it and visualize what you're talking about, then they start to understand the difference between just plain letters versus something that's a morpheme or a suffix versus something that's part of a word. All right, so the scroll bars then can move up and down, um, moves the window up and down so that you can put things in the viewpoint that you want them to be in. All right. I put color backgrounds on these little sight words because then I scramble them. And I, you know, tell the children to put the words back in the correct order. If I don't want them to see the actual text, then I can just draw a, a box over the letters. Okay, so now I can say we want the words in go some snails. And so maybe the child will go go some snail in. Um, and then I can with when I when I ask the child, you know, if I'm doing it by internet and I'm asking the child which word they want to go first they have to tell me by color so they can say the green word first and then the red word and then the purple word and then the orange word. So then I'll read it to them. I'll say, go some snail in. That's not quite the sentence we wanted. Let's check. Nope, we wanted in go some snails. So try again, which color should go first? Orange. Now we need the word go. Think about it. G -g -g. It's gonna start with that G sound, green, okay. Now we need something that starts with a s. Both words start with the S. So one of them is going to say some, one of them is going to say snail. Some, some, that one sounds like it's going to have a mmm sound in it. And if they say purple, then I'll move the purple there. Try it again. In go snail some. Oh no, we wanted in go some snails. So try it again. Anyway, the colors allow me to um, work with them so that they can choose the word order uh, by color. And then I can give them feedback on the correctness of their word choice. All right, so scroll bars keep all of those things in view. All right. We are going to, all I have to do is use the pick tool. The pick tool is this arrow. So make sure that if you want to you know, move or manipulate um, one of the objects that you're still in the pick tool and you didn't switch to text or something else. All right, so I'm going to just hit the delete key and that'll get rid of that. All right, now if I want to focus on something closer, I can either make the window bigger so I'm going to do the um, zoom, the little magnifying glass, and I can make the window bigger or smaller. So these plus or minuses over here affect the window. Or I can hold this over the word I want, little magnifying glass over the word I want, and just that part of the page gets larger, okay? Um, and then I can make it smaller again by just going to the middle and going back to this middle icon. This is the portrait icon, or I can do the landscape icon. Letters and words.
I can use the alphabet over here and I can create words. So you can say snail. I can make it larger either by using just the magnifying glass and leaving it the same size that it was printed and making it larger, or I can just grab the corner and make the word as large as I want it to be. It's gone from 50 This tells you what size. So it was at 50, 48. And when I grabbed it with the pick tool and made it larger, now when I look at it, I've got up to 272 points. All right. So I'm actually making it larger rather than just zooming in and making it closer. All right, so then I can you know, do whatever I want to. I can change the first sound so that the kids can figure out the new word. I can make a list of the words, rail, hail, snail. I can change final sounds if I want to. So basically, it's just a typewriter at that point. It's just a computer typing, just like you would a Word document, et cetera, except that I can have it on the same page on my Inkscape. I can use the scroll bar to go over and find those words. And if I decide that they're too large, then I can just grab the corner and make them any size I want them. If I want to put them on the page next to the word snail, I can. So it's a very, you know, Inkscape is just very flexible in all of the different uses. I can change the font. So I'm going to go to text, text and font. All right. And so I can actually get a a preview of what it'll look like if I change the font. So that's ad lib. Let's change it to Futura. I can change it from Okay, so the scroll bar for that. I can change it to Corbett. I can change it to. We've got hundreds of different files or different um, fonts. All right, I can make it italics. I can make it bold. Bold and italics. I can change the size. Very small medium, very large. All right, so I can do a preview in this text font and I can change the size, I can change this the style and I can change the actual size. And then I just, when I like what I see, then I say apply and you can see that over here now it's adopted that new style. I'm going to talk about importing things. So I have this little uh, Inkscape set up to talk about, this would be like history class, um, Rosa Parks. So I downloaded a PDF of Rosa Parks, but now I want to put it on my Inkscape. So I'm going to Make it small enough so I can see it on the page. And then I'm going to go to edit, take a snapshot. 
and now this little plus sign will come up. So I'm going to draw a square around the text that I want. And then I'm going to come over here and paste it. All right. I might want to change this to landscape. Now it's landscape. So I'm going to close that. Use my scroll bar to kind of put things where I want them. All right. So I can make my text a little bigger so it's a little more readable. And then, of course, I can always just zoom in to a smaller portion of the text at any time. All right. So now I want to have some visuals. It's like this is a lot of text for kids to read, and they might not know a lot of this information. And so I'm going to um, import something. So I'm going, can I, I can either go to file and say import. And I have to find my location of where I'm going to import it from. So I put things in the Inkscape file here. Okay, and I found a JPEG of Rosa Parks that I had downloaded. So I'm going to click on that and import it. I'm going to say OK. All right, so now I have a nice picture that I've imported into my history lesson about Rosa Parks. And this is when she was being charged for not giving her seat up on the bus. All right, so that's one way. If I think, have things already downloaded to my computer, then I use that import command. The second way is to just go directly to the internet. And so I'm going to go to the internet where I have Rosa Parks. And this time I want a picture of the segregated bus. So I'll look at this one. All right, that does a pretty good job of showing. So I'm gonna copy the image and then come back over here. And again, make sure that my lock is on. And I'll just make it smaller. But now the children can get a visualization of what the segregated bus looks like. All right. Um, and so then I can go back to that page and look for a picture of the boycott. Close that one. This looks like a good picture of everybody. There's a better one, maybe, of what a boycott looks like. Equality now. Okay, so again, I can just copy and paste that picture of the boycott. The next way that I can import something is by going to another Inkscape where I might have something stored. So you see that over here, I have a series of pictures stored on another Inkscape. So when I want to look at them a little bit larger, this one with President Clinton, and here's Martin Luther King, and there's Obama. Um, with the statue, et cetera. So those might be some that I want to bring over to talk about the many honors that she received, including Battle of Freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm going to use my pick command. If I just want one of them, then I'm just going to copy and paste and bring it over. But if I want all of them, 
one, two, three, four. I might want to group them, control group. Now they're all one piece, copy and paste. But if I wanted to separate them, then all I have to do is say control ungroup. And so now they're individual pictures again that we can use in our lesson. Let's make it a little smaller here. All right, so I can associate different parts of the text with the different pictures, talking about when she got arrested, um, why she got arrested because of the segregation on the bus issue, and um, what a boycott that we looked like as a result, and then some of her many awards. Okay, so those are some ways that I can um, import things into my document. Another thing that I can do is have the questions, if you remember from my passage, there were some questions at the bottom and all I did was copy them and paste them onto my, my page. So now I can look at my questions. What did Rosa Parks refuse to do? Go to jail, ride the bus, give up her seat or pay for her ticket. Next question. The word boycott is used in this passage as it's used in this passage means, et cetera, et cetera. Third question, fourth question, fifth question. Okay, so it's just again another way that I can use layers to store the five different questions. So we can talk about each one, present each one to the kids, and then talk about them. All right. Now I need to get back to the place where it's in view. So I hit my um, magnifying glass and then I'm going to do my portrait. And we're back to this, I'm going to make it a little smaller. All right, importing to the computer. So we talked internet images, importing by snipping, and that was um, how we put the Rosa Parks article on the page, and importing from a second Inkscape where we got our pictures of awards. All right, I can also export objects. And so I can create an object if I want to, and I can say, um, let's see, 1955. All right, so I can group that picture with the date control group. I could have put some background around it. So I could have drew, drawn a square around it. Let's say I wanted it to be a yellow background. What do I have to do? Don't panic. It's on top and covering it. I just go over here and move it to the back. I am going to control group, move it onto the window, and now it should just export that one picture. Let's see if that works. Export, export, export. Okay, so first I use this export as to find the location and then I use export. And this time because I had it in the window, can you see the difference? 
When I didn't have it in the window, then it just exported the whole page. When I put it actually in the window, then just that picture was exported. I always forget some of these little subtleties. Yeah, so if you're going to export the object, the object has to be in the window. All right, highlighting with lines. You can draw lines. There's a pencil. And I'll to get it straight. I, I start it and then I move. I don't drag it. I just move it to another place. And I should have a nice straight line. Oops. Control Z. If you pick it up too close to the arrows, then you get that funny movement that I just showed you that I didn't want. All right, so it's not exactly straight, but it's close. I can play with it a little bit by using this tool, but. All right, pretty close. Now I can change the color if I want to. Since it's a line, I'm just gonna hit the shift key and then I can change it to red, yellow, green, blue, magenta, pink. <laughs> okay, I can change it to any color that I want. Okay, I can also go down here and click and I can do stroke or style. And I can change the width. So it's like kind of a skinny line and I want a thicker line. So I'm just going to make it a thicker line. And I could put curves in it. I can do a variety of different kinds of things. I can turn it into a dashed line if I want to instead of a solid line. Okay, so I can change my line into these different kinds of configurations of line. But now I can use it to highlight things as we're talking with the kids. So Chief Brown brought home his hardest cases. So what does that mean, bringing home your hardest cases? Um, it gives you a way of focusing the children's attention on some of the words that you, or phrases that you want them to, to learn. You see that it's not quite straight on the page. So remember, I can double click it and nudge my page a little bit here. Now it's a little straighter. All right, so I can use lines to talk about those kinds of things. Um, and so let's see, I can also look at some words that might not be familiar. Let me close the line. All right. Okay. So I can look at words, let's say the word encyclopedia. Um, kids don't even know what an encyclopedia is nowadays. Everybody's got the internet, so we don't really use encyclopedias anymore. But it's a word that's gonna be unfamiliar to them and hard to decode. So we can practice our decoding rules. So first we count the number of vowels and we identify the vowels and I can use lines to do that. So we've got an E We've got a Y, oops, I just did what I told you not to do. If you try to just drag it, <laughs> then you get these funky lines. If I hold it and then just find my end point, beginning, oops, an end point, although C isn't a vowel. All right, so we've identified the vowels. 
and we count them one, two, three, four, five, six. That means we're going to have six syllables. So now we have to figure out, you know, um, every single syllable needs a vowel. So we have to figure out where the syllable breaks are. Well, we've got two consonants together and consonants are like kids, they talk to each other. And so we need to move them apart. Okay. And then we've got a blend that we're going to leave together. So I'm going to put a syllable break, syllable break there. This is a long vowel. And so the vowel is going to break or the syllable is going to break after that long vowel. And this is another long vowel. So the syllable is going to break after that long vowel. And then we're going to break between those two vowels. So we end up with one, two, three, four, five, six syllables. All right. If I want to, I can use, you know, the phonic faces with the kids. Um, and they might not need it for all of the syllables, but they might need it for some of the phonic rules. So I have just already grouped the little phonic faces together according to different kinds of vowel and syllable rules on this page. All right, so we have E and N. Well, the E is, um, is with the N, and so it's going to be the short E. So that's just going to say N, N. But now we've got a CY. And so when you look at the phonic faces alphabet, there's a grown up Y, and he makes the Y sound, Y. But there's a baby Y because he's a vowel. And so he can make sounds like E, 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 like um, um, C, and silly, and funny, and happy, and preppy and you know whatever word ends in y or you can make the i sound like in fly try hi my why so he can make two different kinds of sounds long vowel or a long i vowel or a long e sound generally um, so when you see so that's you know the the y sound in cyclopedia so i can look at that rule over here. And I can copy this one for the kids. Copy and paste. Okay, so when you have Y at the end of a syllable, it's probably going to be a vowel. And in which case it's either going to make a long E or a long I. And in this case, it makes a long I sound. N, Psi. We've got the vowel at the end of a syllable. So if a vowel is at the end of a syllable, it could get hurt if it was a baby. You can't leave the baby sound. So we've got a baby O and we've got an adult O. Okay. And so you can't leave it at the end of the syllable if it's a baby. There has to be a consonant to catch it from running away. And so instead, we're going to be using the long O sound. He says, ah, he gets his throat tested and he says, ah, now he says, oh. The E is another example of the same rule. If you've got a vowel at the end of the, of the syllable, it's almost always a long vowel. So we have our eh, eh, baby who says the eh sound and our E. Um, long vowel over here. So it's not going to be the F sound, it's going to be the E sound. And then we've got D and, and, and an A. Well, that should say die. We've got a vowel at the end of the, of the syllable, so it should say die, encyclopedia die. But that's not, you know, the rule. So English is just so crazy with its rules. So I've marked that rule as well. So when you've got... Uh, Well, 
it's going to be the I sound. I marked the wrong rule. I'm going to spend time looking for it. All right. And then we've got the A sound. Well, when the A sound is at the end by itself like that, very often it becomes a schwa if it's a non-stressed syllable. So instead of saying the A ah sound, usually baby A cries and says A, ah, A. Ah. But when she's at the end of an unstressed, or when she's in an unstressed syllable, she goes to that schwa, uh, uh sound. Okay, so anyway, crazy as it is, um, the visuals help the kids understand how many syllables there are and where the syllable breaks are and how you use the different kinds of rules to come up with the correct, correct pronunciation of that word. Chief is another one that should be if we two bells go walking, the first one does the talking, that should make it chife. But of course, there's an I before E rule. And so you have to apply that I before E rule. I have to get over to my scroll bar here. When I comes before E, the E grown up comes in and makes the E sound, ch, E, f, instead of ch, I, f. So just exceptions to that basic rule. All right. So I highlighted those words either with lines or you can highlight as I did over here with the squares. So you can put squares around the words that the kids are having difficulty decoding or the kids don't seem to be able to process very well. And I can underline things for meaningful purposes. Um, Chief Brown brought his hardest cases. Um, Encyclopedia solved them. So we can show the kids how them means cases, that these two words go together, them refers back to cases. And his hardest cases go back to Chief Brown. So we can talk about how pronouns function um, in these long paragraphs. Storing objects. The one disadvantage that I see in Inkscape is that it doesn't have pages. It's just one page. So you have to store your objects that you're going to use. It's not like I can have a page for page two and a new page for page three and a new page for page four. Um, you, you, know, you can do that in CorelDRAW, but you can't do that in Inkscape. Inkscape only has one window, one page. So again, you've seen me do it. You know, you basically are going to make sure the lock is on bring the page down, move it to the top, and cover the old page. I can still get back to the old page by just moving it. If I want to talk about how something over here relates to something on the previous page, then I can just leave my pages underneath each other so I can easily get back to them. And you've seen me store you know, different um, things all over the place. So these are going to be visual pictures. So this one says it's going to be, you know, page two. And let's see if I find page two. There should be something about said, since he had been secretly helping his father, no crook had escaped arrest and no child had gotten away with ducking the law. Okay. So that might be an unfamiliar expression to kids. So you can have pictures over on the side here where you're talking about things like ducking the law. So this is just a policeman chasing the burglar who was trying to duck the law. And then they talked about the person who was the real mastermind of the gang. 
And so these are just, you know, the person who had the smarts and the person that was making all of the plans. So just visuals to help the kids understand things. This one is, he stood up on flat feet and it's just talking about how heavy everything was. This one is the smell of the ambergris flattened them. So smell made them pass out and that flattened them. So anyway, it's just pictures and visuals that you can store. Um, I can store some of the phonic faces or the, or the uh, phonic rules instead of on the on another um, window, I can just store them there. All right, let's go back to, I've made it full screen. So it's just like any other document. I'm going to go back to partial screen. Creating new windows is very easy. If I want a new window, I just do control N and it makes a new document. Or I can go to file new and it makes a new document. So if I want to have several windows open, I can do that. Um, you just have to be careful if you get too many, then it'll overload the system and it'll crash. Finally, I can make things transparent. So I'm going to go to science now. And there are different commands that you can follow <clears throat> that you can take an object and you can make it more and more transparent. So when I look over here, I've got this full color view of the baby. If I take off the layer of color, then I have a black and white light picture, the same picture, but I am taking off layers um, and making it more transparent. So when you look at this, it's now transparent and I can superimpose it over the color picture. And I can do partial color, put it on the top. There. So I've got partial color. So I can use variations of how much stripping of the background that I want. I can then take this picture and I can superimpose it on the adult and show approximately you know, the size and the shape differences between the adult and the child. So I can do that kind of layering by making some of these more transparent. If I want to save a file, I'm going to go to File, and then I'm going to go Save a Copy. Don't save your Inkscapes using a Save command because it'll make it an internet object. You don't want an internet object. You're going to Save As and make sure it's going to be SVG. So I'm going to you know, save my file as an SVG. Okay. And the same thing when I'm going to open a file. So when I want to open a file, then I'm going to go right click and I'm not going to just say open because that will open it as an internet file. I'm going to open with Inkscape Vector Graphics Editor. And that will turn it into something I can manipulate. If you don't do that, then you just get a picture of your file. But when you try to manipulate it, you can't. You can't move anything. OK, so that's basically a tutorial on using Inkscape and all the many ways that it can help you really effectively work with your kids. It takes a little practice, but it's pretty intuitive after you've played with it a little bit. So I've given you a lot of information. Um, you know, start small and just do a few things. And um, I think you'll find it a very useful tool. All right. Thank you and goodbye.